probably. At least one. I'll do that real quick. And then get to work at nine. Tell me how does aggregate info help in improving the accuracy of a model? Oh, okay, that's such a hard question to answer. <laughs> it seems so simple, but you have to know about data and patterns of data, especially sequential patterns in data. I mean, imagine lots of waves sort of occurring over time. It, aggregation is sort of a way to sample reality so, um, so that you can continue to keep the patterns represented in whatever the sample is. So to know how to aggregate your data, you, you have to understand your data. It's different for each data set, I would say. Um, so I'm gonna leave it at that, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that, um, but I'll mark it and I'll post that video. <laughs> it's my lazy way of answering questions. Um, hello, Tan Binto. I, we've interacted quite a bit over the years. I have just found an interesting paper at a nice 2019 conference. The author uses fast retina key points descriptions for images. Fast retina key points. I don't think I've heard of that. Binding of sparse dist oh, hey, look at that. It's like directly related to HTM. Binding of sparse distributed representations in hierarchical temporal memory. Neomorphic AI Lab, Rochester Institute of Technology. Oh, this is nice. Um, cool. This is from NICE 2019. I don't know that um, workshop is one of the workshops. Day three F. So it's one of these workshops. Um, the author was, what was his name? Luke. Let's see if we can find it. No. Or was it Bohr? B O U D U. UUD. Okay, so these names not there, but they, they might not have, they probably don't have them all listed out for like the workshops, it's just organizing teams and the main speakers, but so that's cool. Announcement agenda, tutorials, demos. I'm not paying attention to whether this is an act. Hey, hey, Mark, I bet, oh, you're probably, you're not there anymore. Whoever's listening, if, if you know this, I've got a record. I have a record that has two copies of the same basic, basically album. Hey Mark, you might know this because you're sort of an audiophile and you're of an older generation that would appreci appreciate this form of media. Yes, the king is in. Um, I've got one mono and one stereo record of the same album. Are those, because this was recorded in like 50 something, six, uh, what is it? Well, it says copyright 1972, but I know these recordings came from earlier because they're all pre-recorded. This is like a, anyway, one's mono, one's stereo. Were those actually two physical, physically different recordings in the, in the time that they were recording different tracks for mono and stereo? Because I'm sitting here listening to the mono version, trying to compare it to my mental model of the stereo version that I hear all the time. I'm trying to figure out if it's actually different. Anyhow, I'm just curious. Um, oh, let me look through the presentation. HTM structure. Region. Okay, we got to be careful here. We want to say mini column. Um, I think, yeah, let's call these mini columns. Uh, we were bad at this in the beginning. Uh, we were bad calling this. Oh, the record lathe works. Oh, I, I, interesting. Okay, so that's cool. That's obviously that's the value of having the, an extra record because it's a totally different recording of the the artists. So that's neat. Hello, James. I was, I was just chatting about um, vinyl records <laughs> with BitKing. 
um, and uh, going over uh, our forum, HTM forum. Computers aren't real. Perhaps not. Perhaps what is real? Nothing's real. If you want to learn what we're talking about, it's hierarchical to forum memory. There's a link in chat there. Um, and explains sort of the concept. Uh, so they were cut separately as two different masters for pressing. They may be the same recording. Oh. I figured that the interesting thing about that for someone nowadays would, would to have, the only reason you'd want to have two recordings, one mono and one stereo is um, if they were different recordings. I would hope they were, but I haven't like noticed a, a difference yet in the background. Just stack more layers. I don't think that's a that's maintainable. Um, or I don't, I don't think that that works the way you think it works. <laughs> yeah, when stereo was new, it was a new feature. <clears throat> okay, I want to look through this spatial pooler structure. So these are mini columns. This is their like potential pool slash receptive field. Each cell receives the same feed forward input. Um, input flows through proximal synapses. Yeah, these are proximal connections. Heavy in learning. Online learning. It's a good summary. Sort of breaking out what an SDR is as represented, represented in spatial pooler. It is nice pictures. I like it when people make their own pictures. So tell, you can tell they have a, an understanding of things. Non-localist, distributed, non-localist resilience. That's an interesting way to put it. Um, learns to map similar inputs, similar outputs. Similarity can be computed with a dot product. Um, and then the essential algorithm explaining overlap, comparisons, and then inhibition. I don't think I've seen these algorithms. I think he's, these algorithms, is, these aren't coming from our documents, I don't think. So that's interesting too. I mean, of course, there's lots of, we had, this all came from intuition of looking at how neurons were working and trying to figure out what they were doing. So we didn't start with the math, you know, you've got to go find the math that explains the biology. So it's interesting to see people finding the math for it, right? That's cool. And I, I'm not going to verify whether this is right, I'm not a mathematician, but, um, but this looks somewhat familiar, the sets. Like I said, I'm not a mathematician, but inhibition. So we're talking about groups of neighborhoods. Okay, motivation. Our research is focused on bioplausibility and emulation of the pathways in the neocortex. I would agree with that. Um, binding operation is the basis for content addressable memory, which could help facilitate long-term storage and retrieval. Content. I've. I think I've heard about this before, but I'm not not enough to define it. Um, this must be his motivation, perhaps. Uh, combine multimodal data without increasing dimensionality. Definitely. That's, this is, uh, HTM is a way to do that for sure. Um, we're gonna check out the asymmetric confidence thread. I have some things to look at that may be wrong. Mm, yeah, I'll pop over there. I've got 10 more minutes. <clears throat> oh, and he's talking about the binding problem. Uh, vector symbolic architectures, vector operations, different, different implementations of VSAs. Uh, I am not familiar with these. Sparse distributed, sparse binary distributed representations. I think I remember this. Brains. Thanks for the follow, James. Interesting enough that you could, you could stick around for the next one. You know, I'm, I have a schedule if you want to look at it, and I try and put events up on my events page. So if you're on Twitch, look down and, at my schedule, and that's usually right. But there's an events, a link to an events page that I try and keep totally updated. So like, there's an event in 10 minutes where I'm going to be working on a project. Um, <laughs> I, I, can, I can feel the sarcasm, James. Um, okay, so this is cool. I don't... Binding and unbinding. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip some of this. Maximally sparse SDRs. Use local bit local inhibition visual polar. Fast retina key point. So this is what I have not 
freak encoding. I've never heard of this before. Fast retina key point. So we're looking at like multi multimodal data or no? Uh, difference in Gaussians. I guess it's something I have to look into is the freak fast retina key point. Fast retina key point. Oh boy. Okay, so it's like basically I'm gonna have to read a paper. I'm not gonna read the paper because I'll. It'll, if it's interesting, if somebody's in, interested in the fast retina free point and you think it's a valid thing to relate to HTM, which this guy obviously does, but basically I'm going to ask someone to explain this to me on the forum <laughs> if you want to. Um, I mean, because I'm, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole right now because I want, I have to get work done today. So like nine to noon, I'm going to be working um, and this is going to take me down. This could be half an hour. You know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, you did a scan of the paper. Okay, cool. Um, cluster analysis, binding experiments. I love seeing this stuff though, I, even though I don't understand what, what it's doing. I mean, the thing, the ideas behind HTM are, are going to be behind a lot of things, you know, of, of understanding more about how, what you, you can do a lot of stuff with it, I think. So that is very cool. That's great. Really, that is, that is really interesting for sure. Okay, um, asymmetric confidence. Oh yeah, so let's go back so we can get a little history on this. So the problem originally was defined by Phil Goddard, and he was trying to figure out why when he fed, fed um, HTM a sine wave, why didn't the anomaly confidence or whatever, whatever you want to call it, he's calling it a confidence, but I think he's just plotting the anomaly score. Um, why does it continue to go, why does it go up and down with the data? And I don't think anybody really understands why. My, my initial intuition was because there's, because there's no reset, so it never knows what cycle, what, um, whether is it in the one period sequence or the two period sequence or the three period sequence, because it's just building up more and more and more and more. And every time it sees and the, this, the value again, it can branch off and create, say, oh, I, I don't, this might be a new sequence or the old sequence. And this one might be a new sequence. And this one might be a new sequence. It never recognizes that this is just one sequence repeated over and over again. Okay, that's the, that's the core problem, I think, that's probably causing this fluctuation. Um, that being said, uh, uh, Mark says, yes, I asked some questions and he tried to change, not, not, not change the symptoms? Try the change, okay. Um, so, uh, makes sense if the confidence was consistent, always good or always bad, or always jittery. So I don't know what, what causes it to change characteristics over time. That's kind of weird. But that being said, again, this is such a dynamical system, it's hard to anticipate what it's gonna do Honestly, um, uh, last two graphs on the change of the funny values. I mean, I'm trying to, I, I'll get to it. I can't remember all the context and I want to think. Because originally it was Phil and then recently, um, we didn't really find an explanation for this as far as I could tell. But then um, Poulin, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, looks like, so I'm interested, Poulin, if you're watching this, did you do this from scratch like yourself, like based on what Phil had done? Um, I'd love to see the code because this might, might be a f an easy code base to sort of change some of the values and see how it affects these graphs. Um, if, it's just, if it's just simple to do that. Like, like I asked you maybe change the jitter to a different value and you did seem to do that pretty easily. Um, but I still, like, what I was saying is I don't understand why anomaly score goes up and down with the wave um, unless it has something to do with it being unsure about, uh, well, yeah, anyway, let's read through what BitKing said. So we see stuff like this when doing integer math, and you wrote an article about this, too, um, that, that I, thought, I figured you would link here. Anyway, <clears throat> um, on MPUs, I don't know the code and totally uninterested in digging through. Um, the nested OOP stuff, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to. You know, it's not so bad in the spatial pooler. Um, 
most of that logic is pretty in the Python code anyway. <laughs> um, problems with signal versus absolute values come to mind. Um, yeah, uh, so absolute values being sort of a ch changing a signal to only output a certain range of it, um, but uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so this gets to be a problem in comparisons. Another common and related problem is shifting frames of reference during calculations. Picking the wrong intermediate value for further calculations. Th this could be related to what I'm trying to say might be, I, I feel is this most uh, suspicious thing, is the fact that it doesn't know that it's one period over and over and over again. It, it just it sees it as a continuously building sequence that will never end. Um, the other two perennial problems are getting scaling wrong. I think, yeah, note that the error seems to vary with the absolute value of the sine wave. Right. And if the calculation was using this input to establish scaling of the value, the error would look something like what is shown. Um, this is based on a time varying value using the before in one part of the calculation and the after in a different part can be maddeningly di difficult to find. Um, yeah, I think you've like probably boiled it down to the core problem because every time step in the past is dependent on all of the time steps in the past previous to it. Um, and because of, we're seeing some randomness in this because you have to establish the initial connections in a, in a random way, but but I think you're just seeing sort of a oscillation of the system as it attempts to learn an unlearnable pattern. Unlearnable because it does not recognize that the period is ending and repeating. That's something, that's a deficiency in temporal memory uh, as it is implemented today in HDM. You, you have to manually tell it this sequence is ended and that sort of cut, severs the connections and then everything bursts again on the next input, so you can start new sequences. That makes if you were if you were doing that at every step of the way here, reset, reset, reset. It would not probably be doing this. It would probably get flat and really confident. Um, but I think what you're hitting at here, Mark, is exactly right. I, I mean, it's not necessary to pin down exactly why this is happening, in my opinion. It's just a, a characteristic of the dynamism of the system that we've set up here. And the fact that it's at least somewhat consistent, um, it's probably a good thing. <laughs> I'd rather see this than a completely noisy graph, of course. I mean, honestly, what you want to see is perfect predictions and no prediction, no anomaly likelihood at all. Um, okay, still going, still going. I'm distracted with my own thoughts. Um, confidence values are the ones that are abnormally fluctuating. I think, I'm pretty sure we're talking about anomaly scores, right? When you say confidence values, because that's not a term we use. I don't know where that came up. I think Phil introduced it, but let's call it anomaly scores. And that's what he's saying. Do you show the anomaly scores in your plot? So the uh, prediction in blue, confidence in orange, anomaly scores in red. This, you're talking about anomaly likelihoods. <laughs> so your terminology is off here. Confidence is anomaly score, and what you're calling anomaly scores is anomaly likelihood, or or an or anomaly indication, or some a flag, anomaly flag, right? Um, and you're saying it's either one or zero. Okay, I'm just getting my term straight here. Um, so he added noise the way I uh, suggested, and it didn't really change things very much. Um, I mean. There's, there's still, uh, it's not, it's not, well, actually, it does look quite a bit more random, doesn't it? But I still, I don't know what that means. Um, Mark, I'm assuming that sine wave is the value between one and negative one, just for diagnosis, diagnostics or whatever, try between zero and one. Uh, makes no material difference to the results presented. Oh, that's Phil. So Phil has been watching this and he was trying, I, I must have missed this part. Assuming it's working correctly, I would agree, unless there's a bug in the software. One of the possible bugs is issues with minus values. Um, I think you've misunderstood my statement. I'm not suggesting there should be no material difference. I'm stating that the above examples have all been executed 
with the sine wave going from negative 1 to 1 and from 0 to 1, and that there's no material difference in the results. Um, I did not see where that was tested in the graphs above. If it seems Phil's correct, I found no significant difference between the results going from 0 to 1. That's... okay. So we're just talking about moving the sine value, and I'm, I'm assuming that everyone is changing the encodings appropriately when they're doing this, because it's, you're going to have to change your encoders. Um, if uh, the encoder, I don't know what the encoder is for the sign, but if it's a scalar encoder, you know, you have to update the min and max and stuff or it will cut the input. You know, it'll only give half of it or it'll, it'll floor it or sealing it. Um, so make sure that you've updated your encoder if you did this, uh, to, for the min and max zero to one and not zero, negative one to one, but I assume that's what you're doing. Um, They certainly are much higher, aren't they? Uh, let's compare. Where was the original one here? Yeah. Let's just save this. I want to look at it. Ah, I should. I need to start soon. This this is interesting though. So th they're definitely higher. But these are if these are anomaly scores, they're not confidences. Oh, I bet anomaly. I bet the confidence value is like the inverse of the anomaly score. Um, okay, no dips below 20% versus 13. Okay, you did, yeah. So how can you say that's the same? That's a good point. If this is in percent, then the value should be the same no matter what the magnitude. Uh, so, so I'm confused about Let's talk about terms. Okay, May, let's just get this terminology thing out of the way. Um, up terms, just to make sure we are all talking. Anomaly score comes out of new pick. It's a raw value between zero and one. You want me to respond to the whole thread? I... Oh, oh, respond to the whole thread, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, anomaly likelihood is the post process we run to get um, a, a val uh, that is easy to threshold, which is used to create anomaly flags. Questions. What is confidence? What, is it, what do they call it? Confidence. Um, conf yeah, what is confidence? Let's say, what is confidence? Here are the typical terms I usually use. Okay. Um, yeah, no problem. What is confidence? And um, how are you getting the, the, the flags in your red line? You're using anomaly likelihood. Okay, I'll post, a vi I'll post this video right here too. Okay, so I'm gonna reply with this and when I come back around, I'll post a video to it. Um, did you reset? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, did you reset the Well, not, uh, uh, did you when you changed right when you changed your input range from negative one one to zero to one did you properly 
up, update the encoder min max. Okay. Okay. All right, now it's time to get to work. Uh, don't forget there's a Bay Area meetup if you want to come uh, hang out with us. Um, I hope you didn't turn off learning. That's you shouldn't you shouldn't turn off learning. That would be a bad mistake. Um, I mean, it's sort of self-evident. Don't turn off learning. <laughs> um, so if you want to, uh, this is at Nementa HQ. If you're in the Bay Area, <clears throat> I'll also be streaming this on Twitch. Um, yeah, there's a couple other things I wanted to talk about. Um, while I have some some people online, because I see Will is there too. Um, I I've been thinking, and uh, Christy and I have been thinking. This is actually her idea, but uh, of going to a conference or two. And so here's something that I've seen people on Twitch do. Uh, other people that are like evangelists for Microsoft or whatever, they'll um, they'll go to a conference. And they'll line up some guests, and they'll and they'll like rent a little room in the hotel, and they'll they'll have quick interviews with people like in the industry. So I was thinking about going to some of these AI conferences for a couple different reasons. One, because we never go to these spaces. I'm not going there to learn about um, machine learning necessarily. I, I would be there to um, to get a feel for what the field is is like out there and what people are saying, and basically to go network and meet people and see if there's anyone anyone technically that's presenting anything that overlaps with like the biological idea ideas that we are are promoting and investigating at all and if so have them on the show like bring them on to twitch and do a live stream while i'm there and talk to people um would anyone be interested in that because i think that might be fun but i definitely don't want to don't want to like waste time prepping and going to a conference and, and doing something like this and putting something live on Twitch if it's like, hey, eh, we just want to see you sit in front of your computer. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So at least that's one. That's one. That's, that's I guess that's good enough. Another one is the O'Reilly AI conference in San Jose. And that's, I think, in September. Um, they don't have a, too much of an, oh, they do have some agenda. No, they did not have speakers here yesterday. All right, so now they've got speakers. Um, TensorFlow, Facebook, Berkeley. Oh, I thought I knew that guy, but I didn't. Anyway, it would be cool if I can get other people, if you, if you look through, if you recognize any of these people on here and you think, oh, they're doing something related to Nementa, they might, they might be interested in talking to us at a conference, let me know and I'll hit them up and I'll say, hey, I've got a Twitch channel. I talk about AI and neuroscience. And um, do you want to come talk about AI and neuroscience on the Twitch show and live? And uh, so I will do that. So let me pop this into chat if you want to see. Here are the O'Reilly speakers and the other one was called Rework. And Rework is like a, um, I'd call it half, half executive, half tech. So it's one of those conferences. It's not a full on tech conference. Um, it's got like a big half of it's a management track and executive track and they're talking about applying AI and the strategies behind building products with AI and all that stuff. Um, so if I did this, I'd probably go with our VP of marketing, Christy Maver, and she would like attend those tracks and I'd go to the tech tracks and we would get a feel for <clears throat> what's going on in the industry. So that's the, uh, that's the idea there. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, 